I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is Psychax, Better Living Through Psychology. And the topic of today's short talk is why men are afraid to approach women. So there are a couple of obvious answers to this question that don't really need the Psychax treatment, but are important to note. So let's just go ahead and get them out of the way at the outset. Men are afraid to approach women because they are afraid of rejection, not only because rejection by definition is frustrating and generally perceived to be painful, but because rejection in this domain carries a special threat, namely that they will be perceived as creepy. This is especially true in the shadow of the Me Too movement. Men are afraid that not only will they be rejected, but they will be shamed or canceled as a consequence of expressing sexual interest. This is the world we live in today. But let's dive a little deeper into this issue because it's not immediately obvious why sexual rejection would be so much more intensely painful for men than other forms of rejection, though it is patently obvious that it is experienced as such by the vast majority of men. And we can consider that the pain of sexual rejection cuts deeper because, from an evolutionary perspective, the survival of the individual is of lower priority than the perpetuation of its genetics. That through the lens of evolutionary theory, an organism that lives a long and healthy life but fails to reproduce viable offspring has failed as an individual because its genetic lineage has gone extinct just as certainly as if he had never lived long enough to reach sexual maturity. On the other hand, the individual that leaves behind an abundance of offspring ideally with different mothers, as the genetic diversity will increase the likelihood that at least some of his children will survive to sexual maturity, is an evolutionary success. In a very literal way, sex is life. And sexual opportunity is both a determinant and a signal of individual success. On the other hand, while lack of sex is not literally death, it is symbolically something much more pernicious, namely extinction. This means that on a very deep level, rejection from a woman not only signifies that the man in question does not deserve to reproduce, but that by extinction, he does not really deserve to exist as his continued genetic existence depends on his ability to successfully reproduce. In this context, it's important to keep in mind that biologists do not declare a species extinct when all of the individuals of that species are actually dead, but when opportunities for reproduction become non-existent. The inability to reproduce is extinction, and the threat of extinction colors every female rejection. And this is a uniquely male threat, as there are few women who could not get sex if they wanted it. It's this asymmetrical privilege, coupled with a failure in perspective taking, that contributes to women's lack of understanding and frustration regarding the importance of sex for men. However, it doesn't end here. Not only does female rejection carry the threat of extinction, but it carries the threat of perdition, as modern man uses woman as the crucible for his self-worth. Let's look into this further. The idea of utilizing a proxy to publicly reveal private merit is very old. And through most of human history, men used contests of arms to do this. Whether in actual combat or in ritualized simulations of combat, the idea was that the victor was not just the strongest, not just the most capable, but the most deserving. In short, the victorious combatant, especially given the chaos and vicissitudes of war, was the one that God favored. This meant that entering into combat was, in a symbolic sense, putting oneself in God's scales to determine whether one had the right stuff. Now, before I go any further, if you're liking what you're hearing, please consider sending this episode to someone who might benefit from its message because it's word-of-mouth referrals like this that really help to make the channel grow. 
You can also hit the super thanks button, the three little dots in the lower right-hand corner, and tip me in proportion to the value that you believe you've derived from this episode because it's donations like that that make all of this happen. Thank you for your support. Now, we don't really have that trial by combat culture anymore. However, the desire to test one's quality remains. And what has replaced warfare in similar pastimes as the crucible of self-worth for modern man, who is man indoctrinated with the ideology of romantic love, is woman. For many men, even if they would not consciously formulate the idea as such, woman has replaced God as the arbiter of their worth. This means when a man approaches a woman, he is functionally allowing her to evaluate his merit by using the encounter as a crucible for his self-worth. Can I buy you a drink sometime? Becomes, both from an evolutionary and a spiritual perspective, do you think I deserve to exist? Now, from a rational perspective, this makes no sense whatsoever. And some men are going to vigorously deny this interpretation. However, it does have the benefit of explaining an anxiety that can't really be accounted for by other conscious explanations. And women certainly do their part to play into this projection. Did you know that the word glamour, which is a distinctly feminine concept, comes from an old Scottish word meaning spellcraft? Female glamour, in the sense of their makeup and their fashion and their behaviors, is a spell designed to bewitch the perception of men into believing they are more than they are. And the more they tap into feminine spiritual archetypes, the more they are successful in this endeavor. So women, whether they are conscious of it or not, kind of conspire with this unconscious belief in men, because of course, if they forewent all of their props, men's desire for them would significantly diminish. Again, men rationally understand that a woman cannot possibly be the arbiter of his self-worth, especially a woman they have just met and has next to no information on which to base such a judgment, even if she wanted to do so. But this fear is not a rational thing, which is why it can't really be dissipated by rational arguments. So how do you overcome approach anxiety? Well, like any other anxiety, it can really only be overcome through exposure and repetition. That is, you get over the anxiety of approaching women by approaching women. And the idea is to approach enough women that the non-terrible experiences collectively constitute an emotionally disconfirming experience of the feared outcome, so that you can reasonably expect, all things being equal, that you will have a non-terrible experience approaching women moving forward. And the best way to do this, I found, is to kind of make a game out of it. Think of approaching women like playing tennis. When you play tennis, you don't have to play both sides of the net. You don't have to visualize how the whole volley is going to go, and you don't have to try to win every point with an ace. All you really have to do is put the ball into play and respond. And as a man, it's your job to serve. It's your job to put the ball into play. But once you do, it's her job to hit the ball back to you. Now, if a woman likes what she sees and hears, she's going to help you. She will hit the ball back to you nice and easy, right where you're standing. Because she's interested in playing, she's going to make it easy to hit the ball back to her. On the other hand, if she doesn't like what she sees or hears, or if she just isn't in the mood to play, she's going to hit that ball right out of bounds. This will look like short or one-word answers, uh, delivered in a cool tone without making eye contact. Gentlemen, trust me, I've approached over a thousand women. This is as bad as it gets. And if she doesn't want to play, you just take your ball and find someone else to serve it up to. On the other hand, a woman who wants to play will make good eye contact, her tone will be warm, and she'll use a lot of words to give you something to work with. Make sense? All you have to do is serve the ball. The rest is kind of up to her. And here's the crazy thing. It doesn't really matter what you say. Because what you say is really just the pretext to engage in a little verbal back and forth. So you don't need to be funny. 
You don't need to be clever. You don't need to be charming, at least not in the opener. All you really need to do is put the ball into play. This will serve as a litmus test for whether she wants to play with you, after which point your natural conversational reflexes will begin to take over. What do you think? Does this fit with your own experience? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've gotten this far, you might as well like this episode and subscribe to this channel. You may also consider becoming a channel member with perks like a priority review of comments or booking a paid consultation. As usual, thank you for listening.